वर्ड्स आर ब्रिजेस शब्द सेतु है अल्फाज दिलों को और इंसानियत को जोड़ने का एक अजीम और तरीन पुल है आखिर अमर बेल संग आखिर अमर जो as a mediation between languages and culture between time and place india's unique literary landscape with its rich diversity and its absolutely staggering multilinguality will be explored through a fascinating series of sessions that bring together writers translators and commentators we at jlf are, are delighted to partner with harper collins india to expand our horizons of reading as we listen in to the original text and also examine its resonance through translations thank you stories provide us place context culture and tradition in india with our vast diversity of uh, linguistic traditions we often don't have access to each other's content the jaipur literature festival brings to you words are bridges to explore translation and writing from across india in association with harper collins at harper collins we've always watched with delight as words build bridges as the books that we publish introduce readers to worlds often unknown to them this is especially true of our translations which wonderfully connect cultures through the written word today unfortunately readers and writers are feeling more isolated than ever before Jaylef's Words Are Bridges is a lovely initiative to connect us all over again. We at Harper Collins are really excited to be part of this program. Thank you, Namita Sanjoy and Uden. Our session today is Here He Comes, Mustache of Kaipura. S. Harish and Jayashri Kalathil in conversation with K. Sachidanandan. Originally published in Malayalam as Nisha, S. Harish's Mustache is a novel of epic dimensions. and a contemporary classic mixing magic myth and metaphor here harish and his award winning translator jayashri kalathil speak with the renowned poet k sachidanandan about the work's deep roots in history geography politics and folklore of the kutana region and how the fabulous is sometimes the truest way to depict real lived experience s harish is the author of three short story collections Adam which received the Kerala Sahitya award Rasa Vidyaud Charitram and Appan he is also among others recipient of the Geeta Hiran endowment and the VP Shivakumar memorial prize Mustache Nisha in the original Malayalam is his first novel Harish is also the author of two screenplays Aidan which received the Kerala state award for best screenplay in 2017 and for the 2019 film Jalikattu which premiered at the Toronto Film Festival and won a silver peacock at the International Film Festival of India. Jayashree's translations have been published in the Malayalam Literary Review, No Alphabet in Sight, an anthology of Dalit writing, and as part of Different Tales, a book series for children. Her translation of Kerala writer N. Prabhakaran's novellas, Diary of a Malayali Madman, was shortlisted for the 2019 Crossword Book Awards for Indian Language Translations. She is the author of the Sack Cloth Man, a children's book that has been translated into Malayalam, Telugu, and Hindi. K. Sachidanandan is a Malayalam poet, bilingual critic, playwright, travel writer, fiction writer, and translator. 
He was earlier professor of English and secretary of the Sahitya Academy and has authored 60 books, including 25 collections of poetry, which have appeared in more than 20 languages, including Arabic, Chinese, English, French, and Japanese. He has won 52 awards for poetry and overall literary contributions, including the Sahitya Academy Award, the International Poetry for Peace Award from the government of UAE, Knighthood from the government of Italy, and the Indo-Polish Friendship Medal. He was in the Ladbroke list of the first 10 probable Nobel Prize winners in 2010 and 2011. Hello, welcome to Harish and Jayashri. Uh, we will have a brief discussion on the translation of Mustache, which is uh, a masterpiece from the young generation of Malayalam fiction writers. We will deal a little with the novel itself and then we will also enter into a brief discussion on the translation and the kind of challenges that, that the translator had to meet while translating a, a difficult book like this, difficult from the point of view of translation. Uh, I, I'll begin by uh, reading uh, a small portion of the opening of the very book. Uh, it's a chapter called Trick Stairs. I read, most people believe that Enam Pechi, the animal also known as Alunka or Pangolin, is a divine creature like the stork or the owl, and that the spirits of dead children appear in its form. But Pagin, who lived on the embankment of the Churiapara fields, knew for a fact that they were also somewhat stupid. In the months of Makaram and Kumbham, very early in the mornings, Pagin would walk east to the mango tree near the dwellings of the Wanian folk, to collect the man mangoes, small enough to be held in one hand, and be skewed over a bowl of kanji that would have fallen to the ground overnight. This task was made stupidly easy by an industrious Inampechi, who would have done the work of gathering them up through the night. Greedy for mangoes, the Inampechi would arrive as soon as the sun set but instead of eating his fill, he would set about collecting the windfall to carry home with him, rolling each mango into a pile, one at a time, two at a time, three at a time. But it was a never-ending job as the mangoes would keep falling throughout the night and at daybreak, having run out of time, the Enampechi would leave without having eaten a single mango. All Pavin had to do arriving just as the creature left, was transferred the pile of mangoes into the basket. One night in the month of Karkidagam, Pavian had gone to the homes of those with overfilled grain chests and stores of paddy to ask for a handful of rice and was walking back home empty-handed in the scattered light. He saw something shaped like a ball in his path. It was the Inampechi. He picked it up, thinking it might amuse his children, make them forget their hunger for a while, and, and put his children and, and put it in, in his basket. He walked fast, hurdling over fences and water ditches, and he heard a voice. Slow down, Pavia, slow down. He realized that the Inampechi was aware of who he was, and yet bore no grudge against him. This is how the great novel opens. I have said elsewhere that it is a, a novel of uh, epic dimensions and I really meant it. And I can easily say that it is one of the finest novels to come from the new generation of Malayalam fiction writers. Of course, Harish was already known as a great writer of short fiction, but with this he established his place in Malayalam literature also as a major novelist. We have had many novelists from the Kutunad area, but this novel is very different from the other novels that the area has uh, given us. Uh, because Misha is a multi-layered narrative and it, it captures the textures of uh, everyday life. 
it uh, in in the region employing several linguistic registers which must have posed a challenge to the translator uh, depending on the context uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the classes and the caste which are involved so it's setting with its unique landscape its fragile ecology its culture which is deeply linked to agriculture mainly wetland cultivation its caste structure and the impact of the social transition in kerala led by sri narayana guru ayyankali and quite a few others who came from the so called lower caste and the diverse fauna and flora peculiar to the region gives the novel a very very uh, very distinct character even among those novels as i said which uh, uh, had come from kutunad earlier like the novels of takari uh, shivashankar uh, pillai for example and the novel captures both the prose of everyday life and also the uh, uh, the, the the poetry of the waterscape of uh, that particular region wavachan uh, who is popularly known as uh, misha mustache a dalit who keeps his mustache uh, which he had grown to act in a play even after the event challenges the authority and hegemony employed enjoyed by the upper caste in the region and legends that grow around him give him a kind of uh, mythical aura the novel thus turns real life into a kind of uh, fable nuanced fable without losing sight of the existential struggles and the evolving history of the region it poses many challenges to the translator that we will of course uh, take up uh, in the uh, discussion uh, with the translator jayashri who has done an excellent job of translating this extremely challenging challenging novel uh, i would i would like uh, uh, harish uh, to tell us and our listeners something about the origins of the novel the genesis of the novel how did it uh, uh, you know first uh, come up in his imagination did it come from his own first hand experience of a of a of a character did it have something to do with the short stories which he had already written how long did he toy with the idea of the novel and what kind of preparations he made for the novel so was it a real life story which got uh, gradually transformed into a legend uh, or a or a myth myth so can you tell us something about the setting of the novel and the origin of the novel you can speak in malayalam if you are uh, more comfortable with that which i and i will try to sum it up in a few words for us yes just perish uh, thank you sir sir varne pole thane thodara onnavude enikku idu prerana ayathu ee stalam thane aanu kutnada upper kutnada ennu parana stalam thane aanu enikku idu pradhanamayittu prerana ayathu adu naan jenichu kollana stalam thane aanu ella eduthukarkum avaru jenichu kollana stalam valla pradhanamaanu അവർക്ക് കിട്ടുന്ന വിഭവങ്ങൾ ജനിച്ചുള്ള സ്ഥലത്ത് നിന്ന് അധികം സാറിന് അറിയാവുന്ന പോലെ തന്നെ അപ്പൊ കുട്ടനാട് ഒരുപാട് പ്രത്യേകതകളുള്ള സ്ഥലമാണ് ജലനിരപ്പിൽ താഴെ കൃഷി ചെയ്യുന്ന സ്ഥലമാണ് മനുഷ്യർ ഉണ്ടാക്കിയ സ്ഥലമാണ് മനുഷ്യർ ഉണ്ടാക്കിയ സ്ഥലങ്ങൾ ലോകത്തിൽ വളരെ അപൂർവമായിട്ടാണെന്ന് ഞാൻ വിചാരിക്കും മനുഷ്യർ ക്രിയേറ്റ് ചെയ്ത സ്ഥലമാണ് പിന്നെ അതിന് ഒരുപാട് തന്നെ നമുക്ക് ദുരൂഹമാണ് നമ്മൾ പാടത്തേക്ക് ഇറങ്ങിയാൽ ഒരുപാട് മരങ്ങൾ കാണാം വിജനമായ സ്ഥലമാണെങ്കിൽ ഒരുപാട് കാട്ടുമരങ്ങൾ അവിടെ കാണാം വീണ് കിടക്കുന്നത് തരിഞ്ഞു കിടക്കുന്നത് എങ്ങനെ ഉണ്ടായതെന്ന് നമുക്ക് അറിഞ്ഞു പോകാൻ ഒരുപാട് ബുദ്ധമത വിശ്വാസം ഒരു കാലത്ത് ഉണ്ടായിരുന്ന സ്ഥലമാണെന്ന് പറഞ്ഞു കേട്ടിട്ടുണ്ട് കുട്ടനാടെന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ ബുദ്ധന്റെ നാടാണെന്ന് കേട്ടിട്ടുണ്ട് അങ്ങനെ ഒരുപാട് പ്രത്യേകതകളുള്ള സ്ഥലമാണ് ഒരുപാട് മിത്തുകളും ഐതിഹ്യങ്ങളും കഥകളും ഒക്കെ ഉള്ള സ്ഥലമാണ് അതുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ എന്റെ പ്രധാന പ്രേരണ ആ സ്ഥലമായിരുന്നു ഈ സ്ഥലത്തെ കുറിച്ചൊരു എന്റെ എഴുത്തിൽ എന്തെങ്കിലും കൊണ്ടുവരണം എന്നുള്ളത് എന്റെ വലിയൊരു ആഗ്രഹമായിരുന്നു അതിന്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ടാണ് ഈ കഥ എന്നിലേക്ക് വന്നതും അതിന്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ടാണ് ഈ ബാവച്ചൻ എന്ന ക്യാരക്ടർ യഥാർത്ഥത്തിൽ ഞങ്ങളുടെ നാട്ടിൽ ജീവിച്ചിരുന്ന ഒരാളാണ് മീശ എന്നാണ് അദ്ദേഹത്തെ വിളിച്ചിരുന്നത് അപ്പൊ അദ്ദേഹം ഒരു ഈ നോവൽ പറയുന്നത് പോലെ തന്നെ ഒരു നാടകത്തിൽ പോലീസുകാരന്റെ വേഷം കിട്ടിയ ഒരു ദളിതനായിരുന്നു അതിൽ പിന്നെ അദ്ദേഹം ആ മീശ എടുക്കാതിരിക്കും അദ്ദേഹത്തെ കുറിച്ച് ഒരുപാട് കഥകളും കെട്ടുകഥകളും ഒക്കെ പ്രചരിക്കുകയും ചെയ്തു എന്റെ ചെറുപ്പത്തിൽ ഞാൻ ഒരുപാട് അടുത്ത് കണ്ട മനുഷ്യൻ ഒരുപാട് കൗതുകത്തോടെ നിരീക്ഷിച്ച ആളാണ് അതുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ എനിക്ക് അതിനെ കുറിച്ച് എഴുതാൻ അത് ആ എഴുത്തോട്ട് ഞാൻ വന്ന അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് പിന്നെ ഇത് നടക്കുന്ന പശ്ചാത്തലം സാറിനറിയാവുന്ന പോലെ തന്നെ ഇരുപതാം നൂറ്റാണ്ടിന്റെ ആദ്യ പകുതിയാണ് കേരളത്തിൽ സാമൂഹിക പരിഷ്കരണങ്ങൾ നടക്കുന്ന കാലമാണ് വിദ്യാഭ്യാസം കൂടുതൽ പേരിലോട്ട് വരുന്ന കാലമാണ് 
അങ്ങനെ ഒരുപാട് പ്രത്യേക പ്രത്യേകതകൾ ഉള്ള കാലമാണ് മതമാറ്റങ്ങൾ ക്രിസ്തുമതത്തിലേക്കുള്ള മാറ്റങ്ങൾ ഒരുപാട് നടക്കുന്ന സമയമാണ് പിന്നെ ഇതിന് എന്നെ സംബന്ധിച്ച് ഒരുക്കങ്ങൾ അധികമൊന്നും വേണ്ടി വന്നില്ല എന്നാണ് അതായത് റെഫറൻസുകൾ കാരണം ഇതിലെ കഥകളൊക്കെ ചെറുപ്പം പോലെ ഞാൻ കേൾക്കുന്നതാണ് ഈ സ്ഥലം എനിക്കറിയാവുന്നതാണ് എന്നാൽ അതോടൊപ്പം തന്നെ ഞാനിതിന് ഒരുക്കത്തിന്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ട് ഞാൻ കുട്ടനാട് മുഴുവൻ കാലനടയായിട്ട് കുറെ സഞ്ചരിക്കുകയും ചെയ്തിരുന്നു അതിന് അത് പല സമയത്തായിട്ടാണ് ജീവിതത്തിലെ പല കാലഘട്ടത്തിലായിട്ടാണ് തുടർന്ന് ഒരു അൻപത് വർഷം ഇത് എഴുതാനെടുത്തു എഴുതിയപ്പോൾ എന്നെ നവീകരിച്ചു വരുന്ന ഒരാളാണ് മേശി എന്നാണ് ഞാൻ കരുതുന്നത് കാരണം അത് എഴുതി തുടങ്ങുമ്പോഴുള്ള എന്റെ രാഷ്ട്രീയം അല്ലെ എഴുതിയതിനു ശേഷമുള്ള എന്റെ രാഷ്ട്രീയം നോവലിനെ കുറിച്ചുള്ള എന്റെ കാഴ്ചപ്പാട് മാറ്റി വരുന്ന ഒരാളാണ് മേശ അതിലേക്ക് വളരെ സന്തോഷമുണ്ട് പിന്നെ ഇത് സി ഇത് ഇത് ഇറങ്ങിയ സമയത്തുണ്ടായ പ്രശ്നങ്ങൾ അറിയാമല്ലോ സാർ അതായത് ഒരു മാതൃ മാറ്റി പ്രസിദ്ധീകരിക്കുകയും അത് പിൻവലിക്കേണ്ടി വരികയും വളരെ സന്തോഷം ഇത് ജയശ്രീക്ക് ഞാൻ പ്രത്യേകം നന്ദി പറയുന്നു കാരണം ജയശ്രീ സാർ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ അസാധാരണമായ ഒരു വർക്കാണ് ജയശ്രീ ചെയ്യുന്നത് ഈ പുസ്തകം ഇംഗ്ലീഷിൽ നന്നായിട്ട് വായിക്കപ്പെടുന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അതിന്റെ പകുതിയിലധികം ക്രെഡിറ്റ് ഞാൻ ജയശ്രീക്ക് കൊടുക്കുകയാണ് അതുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ മലയാളത്തിൽ മീശയുടെ ഒരു ഭാഗം വായിക്കാം മീശയുടെ അമ്മ ചെല്ല മരിച്ചതിന് ശേഷമുള്ള ഒരു ഭാഗമാണ് ഞാൻ വായിക്കുന്നത് മൃതദേഹത്തോടുള്ള ആദരവാണ് മരണാനത്തിലും ചെയ്യേണ്ട കർമ്മം എന്നറിയാവുന്ന മീശ തനിയെ വലിയൊരു കുഴിയെടുത്ത് അമ്മയെ അതിൽ കിടത്തി കൈകൊണ്ട് കുഴി മൂടി മുകളിൽ ചവിട്ടി ഉറപ്പിച്ചു ശേഷം തൊട്ടടുത്ത് മറ്റൊരു കുഴിയെടുത്ത് പുല്ലുകളും ചപ്പുകളും കൊണ്ട് മറച്ച് അതിൽ ഒളിച്ചിരുന്നു മരിച്ചതുപോലെ കണ്ണടച്ചും ശ്വാസം പിടിച്ചും നീണ്ടു തുറന്നു കിടന്നു അർദ്ധരാത്രി കഴിഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ അവൻ കണ്ണു തുറന്ന് ചെവി ഓർത്തു തൊട്ടപ്പുറത്തെ കുഴിയിൽ നിന്നും അടക്കി പിടിച്ച സംഭാഷണങ്ങൾ എന്തോ വേറെ ചെയ്യുന്ന ശബ്ദങ്ങൾ കാലന്റെ കിങ്കരന്മാർ എത്തിക്കഴിഞ്ഞെന്നും അവർ നാലു പേരുണ്ടെന്നും മീശിക്ക് മനസ്സിലായി അവർ അമ്മയെ നാലായി ഭാഗിക്കുകയാണ് പതുക്കെ പുറത്തിറങ്ങി മീശ കുഴിയിലേക്ക് എത്തി നോക്കി ചുറ്റുപാടുകൾ ശ്രദ്ധിക്കാതെ സ്വന്തം ജോലി ചെയ്യുന്ന തിരക്കിലാണവർ മനുഷ്യരെ പോലെയല്ല ഒരേ സമയം ഒരു കാര്യത്തിന്റെ അവർ ശ്രദ്ധ വെക്കാൻ കഴിയും അവരെ കബളിപ്പിച്ച് ഒരു പങ്ക് അപഹരിച്ച് മീശ വീണ്ടും കുഴി കുഴിയിൽ ഒളിച്ചു അല്പം കഴിഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ കുഴിയിലെ ശബ്ദങ്ങൾ ഉയർന്നു തുടങ്ങി നേരത്തെ വർത്തമാനങ്ങൾക്ക് പകരം വലിയ ആക്രോശങ്ങളും തെറിവിളികളുമായി മീശ ശ്വാസം അടക്കി പിടിച്ച് എല്ലാം ശ്രദ്ധിച്ചിരുന്നു കാണാതായ ഒരു പങ്കിനെ ചൊല്ലി കിങ്കരന്മാർ തമ്മിൽ തള്ളുക ബാക്കി കാര്യങ്ങൾ ജയശ്രീ സംസാരിക്കട്ടെ കൂടുതൽ യുവത്തെ കുറിച്ചുള്ള കാര്യങ്ങൾ സംസാരിക്കട്ടെ സന്തോഷം Uh, yeah what uh, for the, for those who don't know malayalam i won't i won't uh, translate what uh, harish said but i would just say that uh, first he said that uh, kottanad is his birthplace and naturally any writer will have a kind of profound and deep attachment uh, with the uh, place where he he or she was born uh, uh, and and wawachan the protagonist or uh, who is also called misha uh, uh, was a real character around whom a lot of legends grew and uh, it was from those stories that he collected over the years that he uh, began uh, imagining this uh, whole novel uh, in the introduction he has said he took about 12 years to prepare the uh, i mean uh, to to write the novel he traveled around the whole of kutnad he studied the landscape uh, he studied the people the various kinds of dialects and so uh, he uh, it is enough preparation that he started writing the novel and he also said that the writing the writing process uh, has changed uh, his attitude one to the to the novel as a shorn and secondly uh, it has also changed his political attitude because you know this has been also seen as a novel of dalit empowerment because uh, uh, by uh, keeping the 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 mustache uh, the, the misha wabachan uh, in some sense was challenging the hegemony of the upper upper caste in in kutnad uh, so uh, so it was a novel which transformed the author and of course uh, which is uh, expected to transform also the reader uh, in an equal measure uh um uh, this is what mainly he said that he read a, pa- a portion from the novel uh w- uh which deals with the uh, demise of uh, the protagonist mother uh now i will tend to uh, jayashree 
Uh, I'll ask you something about uh, the process of translation. I don't think we have much time to go into deep theory <laughs> of translation, even though we are all familiar with all those theories, you know, uh, right from Gayatri Spivak to the cannibalistic theory and all that. We won't go into that. Uh, I'll, 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 let me ask you some very simple questions. Now, what, uh, what's it, uh, how did you come to translate the novel? I know that it was a commission translation, if I understand rightly, it was commissioned, yes. Uh, but even then, even even when somebody asks you to translate a novel, you don't really, uh, you know, uh, jump at it unless you are uh, ready to do that. And unless your own mind tells you that this is a novel uh, worth my time, this is a novel that uh, I, I need to translate, and this is a novel that's going to be a contribution to the larger uh, corpus of uh, Indian literature or, or even world literature. So that is what actually tempts you into the act of translating a novel. So what were your, your temptations? Uh, I mean, what were, what were the things that actually drew you into this novel and into uh, this uh, very hard task of translating a difficult work? Okay, yeah. Um, like you said, I was asked to uh, translate it by Rahul Soni at HarperCollins because I'd done one, just one book before that for them. Um, I had read Misha when it was being serialized in Madhubhumi. So when he asked me, I had only read those two first installments. I hadn't read the rest of it. So I told Rahul that first I need to read the book because I, I generally, I, I, I haven't translated much. This is only my second book. Um, but even when I'm interested, I, I want to be interested in the story initially. So he sent me the book to London and I read it, actually traveling back to Kerala for so yeah, but I, I I really liked it. That's the main. The first thing was just falling in love with the book and the world that Harish has created within that book. And I love storytelling of that type where there is so many stories layered, and you know it, it kind of takes you into different places. It's not just this linear narrative with a beginning, middle, and end. And it just so I like that kind of almost oral tradition of storytelling which builds one on top of the other. So that was obviously one of the reasons. And the language is the next, it's, it's, it's lyrical it, in places, it's in your face in places. It's very, there, there are many languages within the book. So this is, a, this is quite a challenge as a translator. And I, and I was really, really scared to begin translating. That first section that you read at the beginning, I think I probably rewrote that about 10 times and then left it and only came back to it at the end of the book because I just couldn't, I, I couldn't start the book at the beginning. So, you know, so it, it was, it, in that sense, it was really, really challenging, but in a very interesting way. Um, the other interesting thing is just the diversity and the language Harish has used to talk about the land, the waterscape the flora and the fauna and the fish. And I have this fascination with nature and just being able to play with language itself more than anything of the real story or the politics, etc. All of that is important, but giving that, having a chance to do that, all of this drew me to translating it. By no means a simple task, yeah. Uh, yeah, of course it must have been very difficult to capture the whole texture. Uh, of the of the novel, um, especially because uh, uh, you know there is a kind of interweaving of both uh, short narratives and of languages, as you as you very well said. Uh, how did you how did you grapple with that, and how did you finally come out, uh, if I can say, successfully? Uh, you know, uh, would you say something about? It? So usually, as a translator, people ask you about how do you translate not just the language of the novel, but the culture of the knowledge to a reader who is not familiar with that culture. But I feel that with Nisha, the translation begins even before you're trying to put it into English. I am from Malabar, from Malappuram, up in the hills, you know, and my language is very different from the language Harish has used in Kutanadu. Kutanadu is as exotic to me as it is probably a Londoner because I've been there on holidays, I've seen it in films, I've read it in literature, so I'm familiar with it, but I'm also very unfamiliar with it as, as a culture, as, as nature, as geography. 
so there is first a translation that i am doing within myself in terms of being familiar with this world harish has created and there is just only one way to do that and that is just by immersing yourself in the text i i literally lived misha for several months uh, not 12 years that it took harish to write it but you know long enough to kind of get used to that and harish is harish also through the story he also demands us to look very closely to it i mean the repetition of place names for example where somebody travels he kind of he literally tells you all of the little places and the, the detail in flora fauna etc what that told me is that you have to look really closely at this you have to kind of get into it so i read a lot about below sea level farming about how they built up paddy fields out of nothing about all kinds of fish and looked at pictures of snakes and trees and you know so there was a kind of trying to build that around me the actual translation itself like i said i didn't do it in a in a in an order of it's only in the second draft i kind of went through the order in the first draft i did wherever i thought i will do not in the order from chapter 1 to the end um and there are many languages in this book so for example there is when the protagonist the narrator of the story speaks to his son that is a different language from uh, when he's talking about ravatan and his adventures or when he is describing nature or this whole chapter made of songs of the fields and the water wheels so there is more than one language in the book so you can't really kind of just think about language it is about i think it kind of evolves in the in 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 a way that it works and i'm sure there are places in the book where it probably hasn't worked but as long as those who read it feel that it is worked i would be quite happy i think one thing i ref, uh, kind of refrain from doing is to try try and sort of find an english that is like a patois or existing english and try and fit it back into a cotonadan dialect i didn't want to do that and I, i hope i haven't done that at the same time i also did not want to mainstream it entirely to make it comfortable reading because the book is not comfortable and i don't think the translator's job should be to make it comfortable reading for everybody so i'm hoping that 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 weight of the book is still there in the translation yeah um see uh, one one thing i noted about the book is that uh, you haven't given thankfully uh, many footnotes and appendices and uh, you know uh, there is not much referencing and all that in the book uh, because in many indian translations you know they they are mostly cluttered with uh, references and footnotes making reading uh, almost impossible uh, but you have very cleverly and uh, uh, deliberately i think avoided uh, you know such uh, elaborate footnotes uh, in that uh, was it a conscious decision uh, not to uh, give so many footnotes and uh, uh, leave it to the reader of course partly it is possible now because of the internet a lot of people can go to the net and find things it's it is easier than it used to be before uh, but was it also part of your decision uh, to make the reading easier by not having many footnotes and uh, you know appendices and references and all that it was yes um i think part of that has to do with the fact that i don't like interrupting my story as in if i'm reading a book i don't really want to see footnotes if i want to find something out i'll find out when i'm ready for finding out so that's but i think the probably the more important reason is that i'm a writer who writes from london Uh, so i am a minority here as a migrant and minority there is always the question of how you use english you know you are expected as a minority as a migrant to explain yourself all the time um because the english is their language and where they don't you know you don't write you're not expected to write like a minority you are expected to cater to the mainstream and i refuse to do that you know it, it's like i will write like a minority and you will make the effort to read it maybe it is arrogance i don't know but i think it is also the politics of it and 
there is a way you can bring in a lot of explanation into the text but without taking it away to, without derailing it too much from what harish's storytelling is doing but um we did we did actually consider putting in a glossary at the end um not as footnote maybe a glossary to sort of explain something but then we thought whatever we wanted to explain and specifically i think one of the main things that we were discussing about explaining was the whole caste relationship that was in the book but i think harish's introduction covers it quite you know yes. quite well and quite in depth so we didn't feel like we needed another you know glossary or then translate some of the malayalam words that i've retained like for names of fish or whatever but we didn't feel the need to do that i think i think i think the book is difficult yes but i think it is people will get it when they read i think <laughs> yeah i i know that translation is a kind of uh, rock walking because you cannot be too literal you can't do that because then it uh, it becomes tedious you know reading the translation at the same time you can't deviate uh, very much from the original so you need to keep a kind of balance you cannot erase the authorial presence from the from the text even when you translate so the author ought to be there somewhere so it it needs to read well but it also needs to read like a translation you know you know walter benjamin who uh, says in his uh, famous essay task of the translator that a translation should read like a translation not that it should read like original and i think you have perfectly managed that kind of a balance because you know when you read it it is a translation it comes from another culture it comes from another language or it comes from many languages and uh, at the same time uh you are able to navigate easily through all those various layers uh, of caste and class and language and dialect and uh, uh, and that must have been i think uh, the, the greatest challenge that you faced as a as a translator uh well uh, you in your note to uh, the translation uh you refer to uh the magic realism uh, of uh, harish's novel uh, that uh, you know that reminded me of uh, because uh, because i think uh, that that comes from uh, actually a kind of realism because it it reminded me suddenly of an interview that pablo neruda had given towards the end of his life you know he was asked um, uh, i think it was an interview with robert bly who was one of his first translators uh bly said well there is a lot of uh, surrealism in your uh, poetry uh, how how come that you are, are you a surrealist and pablo neruda said well the reality of chile is surrealist yeah. and and that is what you find in in, in my poetry and i think uh, this uh, you know uh, uh, applies very well to a novel like misha because the reality of kutanan itself is surreal with all those very strange animals various kinds of fish various kinds of plants and the remains of the forest as a uh, as that harish referred to uh, in his introductory talk uh, so uh, the, so there is something surreal about the whole place and that is made even more surreal by the presence of uh, uh, the, the the protagonist vavachin uh, uh, who grows a mustache and a mustache which itself grows into a major uh, you know fable or, or or a myth and and so i think this uh, this peculiar kind of uh, juxtaposition of the real and the surreal or the real and the magical and uh, that's what gives the novel a character which is very different from a novel like kayan by tagari which is also you know uh, uh, based in in kutanad or his other novel say like chemin even the chemin has a minor uh, mythical uh, dimension to that is related to a kind of belief among the fishermen so uh, so there is a, so i think uh, um, harish has achieved a perfect mixture of this uh, of the real and and magical and you in your translation have been uh, to a very great extent uh, able to capture uh, that kind of a conversation between the between the real and the unreal or the or, or the or the surreal I, th i think that is one of the basis of the of the success of uh, your transition i would i would like you to read uh, maybe a portion from your transition something that you yourself have suggested uh, because our time is running out and i think it will be good yes. to have a room 
So I, I'll read a section um, where the, there's two places, the two main places in the book where the, the flood is uh, described and what happens to the land after the flood. So just a small section yeah. from one of those. Please do. The rain that began after Chela's death continued, relentless even after 10 days. Those were days when no one ventured out, but there were those who saw Vavachan walking along the field edges in Pulikutisheri, Menongkari, Kalkatra. He had spread his moustache over his head like a giant taro leaf, sheltering himself from the rain. His moustache protected him like the dry leaf protected the mud clod in the old story. He was a lucky man. He did not need to look for a place to sleep. He could just build a tent with his moustache when night fell. Perhaps these were just the hungry illusions of those stuck at home with nothing to eat. Some even said that they saw a moustache carrying a sack of rice on his head. But how could that be when there was not a grain of rice, not even oil pumice or bran to be had? Several people died eating bitter tapioca leaves. Others ate the palm shoots that were meant to feed the ducks or the fish clams and mussels they could find boiled in salted water as there was no chili or coriander to be had. They ate through the yams and banana stems and turned their attention to cattle feed. Some Christians and Nayars who had seed stalks of paddy meant for the next planting season, hired guards armed with machetes and hatchets and then took to sleeping on top of their seed chests, their sleep disrupted by the distrust of their own guards. And yet people saw through the curtain of rain, the specter of moustache walking along, carrying bunches of banana and tapioca. There was a rumor that he had taken to capsizing the boats ferrying paddy. Shelleyuda Mahasheshamulla Mada, Patthu Devasangayinu Maata Milaadha Thunum. Aarim Puratharangatha Devasangayil, Kulikutti Sheriyilim, Mayanam Kariyilim, Kallingatrayilim, Ura Padavaram Puriyilkudi Vavachin Nadanda Poonu Kandavarum. Tanda Meeshwari Atta Madaya Nairarulla Maranjimil Ila Pole Ayam Thalakki Mughal Vidaudthi Chudiyilim. Kariyilam Annangatta Yenna Pole Madaya Atta Meesha Ayala Thunachum. Ayam Bhagiyavarana, Thalajaikyaan Ita Thiri Alayenna. Yiltu Pol Chittinratthu Vecche Tanda Meeshwakundu ഒരുപാടം <laughs> <laughs> വെളിഞ്ചേപും വാഴമാണവും തന്നപ്പോൾ പശു തിന്നുന്ന പുല്ലിലേക്കായി ആളുകളുടെ ശ്രദ്ധ അടുത്ത കൃഷിക്കായി നെൽവി തുണക്കി സൂക്ഷിച്ച അപൂർവ്വം ക്രിസ്ത്യാനികളും നായന്മാരും വാക്കത്തെയും കൂടാലിയുമായി ആളുകളെ കാവലത്തിൽ പത്തായത്തിനു മേൽ കിടന്നുറങ്ങി കിടന്നുറങ്ങി കാവൽക്കാരെയും വിശ്വാസമില്ലാതെ ഇടയ്ക്കിടെ ഞെട്ടി ഉണർന്നു എങ്കിലും ആളുകൾ വലിയ വാഴക്കുലകളും കിഴങ്ങു നിറച്ച കിഴങ്ങു നിറഞ്ഞ കപ്പമൂടുകളുമായി വിദൂരതയിൽ നടന്നു പോകുന്ന മീശിയെ മഴക്കിടയിൽ കൂടി നിഴലായി കണ്ടു Uh, thank you. I, uh, you know, I, I really didn't want to make any reference to the kind of controversy around the book because that I think is part of the past. But there is no harm in, in, the, in the readers knowing that, well, there was a controversy and uh, Harish had to withdraw uh, the novel which was getting serialized in uh, a very significant weekly in Malayalam, uh, Madhubhumi. Uh, but what I liked uh, uh, about one of the things I liked about Harish's introduction to the book was his reference to the controversy and his reply to the controversy, which which I uh, which I really want to read. It's just a sentence, you know. Uh, the controversy was uh, one around uh, a word which was supposed to be obscene and not generally used in the so-called uh, elite and decent language, referring to a, a woman's organ, uh, and the other was about the reference to a temple. Uh, and the difference of God, you know, sentiments are very easily hurt these days. And uh, uh, so somebody's sentiment got hurt with that. And replying to the whole controversy, Hadish has uh, uh, these uh, two sentences. There have been protests about this. And I agree that these characters should have shown more care and behaved more responsibly. But novels are free countries. And there is very little a writer can do about what the characters 
get up to. I think I think it is a very very <laughs> extremely important reply because uh, Harish is replying not only for him but for all the writers, including me, for all the writers. Because you know when you write your characters or the, or those who uh, the subject of your poem or the or a character in your novel might be speaking, and you cannot uh, uh, attribute the words of the character to the author and say it is the author who is uh, speaking it is actually the character and, and and there is a particular context to uh, the use of a word or to the to the use of a reference or or to a conversation and you cannot just forget the context and uh, uh, blame the author for, uh, for what the character does or what the character uh, says so he's speaking for Salman Rushdie. He's speaking for you know thousands of authors who have run into controversies uh, on account of the kind of characters they created or the context uh, in the in the fictional works uh, that they had imagined. So they, they and I think it's the perfect justification uh, for uh, and and the perfect answer to all those who tried to create a controversy around around the novel. Now, I would like Harish to say one or two sentences in conclusion. Uh, he has been listening to this uh, after his initial introduction. Harish, would you just come in and say uh, if, uh, two or three sentences about the novel or about the translation? Harish? Uh, Jesuit was never the name, uh, would uh, English is a good thing to do with the English language. Yeah, what Harish said was that initially he had his own uh, anxieties about the novel being translated, especially because of its uh, you know, linguistic nuances and the linguistic diversity. Uh, but uh, ultimately, when the novel, the translation came out, he was quite happy to see that uh, uh, it has become a highly readable uh, and uh, a somewhat faithful translation uh, of the novel. And uh, he wants to thank Jayashree for the wonderful work that uh, she did with the uh, uh, original work. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, could perhaps be a fitting conclusion to what has been a very cordial uh, kind of uh, discussion uh, and I uh, also want to thank uh, uh, both of you for your wonderful interventions and responses to whatever uh, uh, queries I had uh, and I hope that uh, all readers interested in fiction will uh, uh, pick up this uh, novel, Mustache. I'm not doing a publicity for Harper Collins. I'm not doing a publicity for the author or the translator, but a publicity for the art of fiction. And so I, I, I wish everybody would uh, pick up the novel and uh, uh, read the translation and enjoy the many dimensions of uh, this astonishing uh, work of fiction. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful session, Sachidanandan Harish and Jayashree. And thank you all of you for being such a wonderful audience. If you've enjoyed the session, do share it with your friends and on your social media channels to spread the word and do send us your feedback. We value it highly. We look forward now to seeing you in our next session next Thursday.